Thank you very much for coming down to our breakfast this morning. Uh, it's a bit of a full house, so um, if you can find a seat anywhere, I think there's one or two here at the, at the very, very front. Um, it's been a very popular talk, actually. Um, thank you for coming down, and I'd like to welcome uh, our newest associate members, uh, Piano, uh, to the PPA, and also start off with this first briefing on how The Economist is partnering with Piano to identify loyal readers, increase engagement, and drive digital subscriptions. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jonathan Hebbs, who's going to obviously introduce uh, the talk and take you through the agenda. Um, but thank you very much for your time, everybody. Mike, thank you. So good morning to everybody on a very warm day. It must be the warmest day of the year we, we chose for, to get everybody in one room, so that's, that's good. First of all, thanks to Mike for helping us put this together. It's a very exciting time for us in piano in the UK and, and Europe in particular. Um, so what we've done, I'm going to go through the agenda. Um, on your chairs is the uh, publication that we've, uh, we have. It's a publication by piano called Traffic. It is jam-packed with industry challenges and industry solutions. And it's a very valuable document and hopefully you can take that away and, and enjoy it at your leisure. Um, secondly, um, as a thank you to you for taking some time out of your busy schedule to come, I hope you can enjoy your uh, piano notebook. Um, you can uh, jot down some relevant pieces and take away from uh, today as an aid memoir and use it for that. Um, today's agenda um, is very much around, uh, as Mike's already said, Reach to Revenue from Trevor Kaufman, CEO of Piano, and Mark Brinkat, the evolution of the Economist <coughs> platform. Um, we're going to have those two presentations. Around about 9.45, we're going to give you the opportunity for Q&A, if you would like. At 10 o'clock, we're going to then have the end, but we would encourage you to use that opportunity to network uh, in th this uh, industry, network with friends, colleagues, enemies, however you, you want to do that, um, and make new friends as well and, and spend some time with them. And there is a number of people from Piano here, as well as the PPA that you can talk to. So thank you for being here, and let me introduce you to Trevor. Thanks, Trevor. I'll, uh, I'll get right into it and first just echo Jonathan's thanks for, um, for everyone being here. This is a, a presentation that uh, I've been giving over the last couple of months about how we see the world at Piano and the things we've learned working with a lot of publishers. We've been very fortunate to work with a number of publishers, The Economist most notably, uh, but, but several around the world as they've been developing strategies for making more money in digital. And there's so much experimentation and so much learning uh, happening right now um, that it, it's can be a little tricky to summarize, but I'll, I'll do my best. So we, we, my background is in, um, it was running a set of agencies for WPP, and it's been really uh, interesting for me to see how differently people in media think about business in general from most traditional sectors. Um, it is a truism that businesses succeed by influencing consumer behavior by marketing to them. Whether you're a law firm or whether you're selling bacon buddies, you, you, you want consumers to behave a certain way. This is Black Friday in, in the US and people lined up outside Best Buy at five o'clock in the morning waiting for it to open in the cold. And this marketing process, and I'll avoid giving a sort of marketing 101 talk, but is usually depicted in some kind of funnel where you have users or consumers at various stages of involvement with the brand. And as they go through these different phases, you're trying to move them through a purchase process to becoming a customer and then a retained customer. And this is obviously a sort of um, very rudimentary idea about how things are marketed. What's interesting is that media was traditionally the same way. The definition of the customer was quite specific. You had people who bought once or people who were subscribers. The same thing is true in print media where you have people who buy once or people who are retained subscribers. What's really interesting right now is we have this very strange new group of people who aren't really customers at all. And publishers talk a lot about their audience. 
But what they really mean is these people who might not really have any familiarity with what they're doing at all, who are finding them through social channels, might not even be aware of who has written or who's published the article that they're reading. And so there's this tremendous challenge in digital media, which is quite specific, which is how do we take this massive group, which could be a hundred times orders of magnitude larger than the actual customer base, and monetize them. So the monetization challenge is made more difficult by the nature of most media businesses. When we think about publishers and editors as the leaders of media businesses, publishers are traditionally guys who run the business, or women, who run the business side, and the advertising group reports up to them, and they're fabulous business-to-business -business marketers who are used to uh, getting brands involved in what they're doing. But they're not necessarily very good consumer marketers. We don't, mo there's not a, you wouldn't think of an editor or a publisher necessarily have a consume, having a consumer marketing background. And what we find as we deal with publishers is that as much as there is a shift to digital, there's a real gap in their ability to handle consumer marketing. And there are, of course, exceptions to this. A lot of the smartest uh, publishers and digital media organizations have a significant rank of consumer marketing. Uh, people inside of them, but, but a lot don't. And it's very difficult for them to figure out how to integrate those activities with other things they're doing. The, the other problem is, of course, programmatic advertising is blowing up this traditional relationship between the, uh, the publisher as a business-to-business -business marketing organization and the brands they traditionally sold to where increasingly that, uh, those interactions are taking place through marketplaces rather than through bespoke programs. Um, and on the editorial side, there's this obvious and tremendous, to some extent, distraction from the business of the business. You know, now, all of a sudden, you're taking a, a, an editor and a, a newsroom or a, or a set of, of, of content creators who are used to creating things for a relatively small, comparatively, and finite audience. You, know, you take a newspaper with a circulation of a million people um, who all paid for it. And now those, those, uh, those guys are watching Chartbeat in a newsroom, seeing how many people are reading their story that minute. And it's like crack cocaine compared to the actual question of how the money's being made. And the money increasingly is not being made through display advertising. So this is, uh, this is the New York Times' uh, revenue curves over the last uh, 15 years or so. And what you see is this is the, this is the advertising revenue here, and this is the money they're making from digital circulation. And that crossed a few years ago, and now they have Mark Thompson, the CEO, has this, um, this uh, initiative to grow to, to 10 million subscribers uh, around the world, and so they're breaking into new markets. But what's really interesting is what happened here. You know, they were doing much, much better in digital advertising than they're doing now. And of course, what happened to them was not that they got bad at selling advertising, but that Facebook, consolidated all of the advertising spend. And there's, there's a lot of debate about the statistics of exactly how much advertising of, of the advertising pie Google and, and Facebook actually uh, uh, take up, but you know, the, the conventional wisdom is that for every dollar that moves from traditional to digital, 85 cents of it is taken by Facebook or Google, leaving everyone else of all stripes uh, to try and uh, share the rest. So um, the, the, the reason for that, right, the reason for the, the decline of, of, uh, of that advertising uh, dollar for publishers is not only Google and Facebook, although that's a huge factor, and I, I have some, some fun slides about that, but also because in a world of infinite inventory where there are no barriers to entry, it's just really hard to have any scarcity that will affect price. This is uh, uh, um, from the back pages of, of traffic. Um, our, our editors did a, a little uh, thought exercise to figure out how much online advertising there really was. 
And basically, if you put all the display ads over the course of a year end to end, um, you get to a, 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 an area which is galactic in size, right? So very, very difficult when an when a advertiser can buy audience anywhere they want to try to sell them on the adjacency and the premium quality of, a, uh, of, of something in, in a premium content brand. Advertisers I talk to say, well, we would pay 30% more for that, but we won't pay 5x for that in the way that they used to. So what we're focused on is at Piano is tools to help publishers market and fulfill digital content in these ways. And I, I want to go through kind of our product set so you understand the way we are, are th the, the way we think about it. The process of marketing to consumers, marketing content to them, and the process of handling the rights associated with what somebody can see across platforms requires a lot of pieces of technology. And it's our belief that a lot of the uh, experimentation and innovation that should happen in digital business models has not because of the technology investment required historically. So uh, I'm asked very frequently, who else is doing innovative things in monetization? And, and I always, my, my knee-jerk reaction is, well, not you, because like everybody else, you're sort of waiting to see what everyone else does. So we have these sort of two, certainly in paid content, we have this metered paywall and this freemium uh, kind of some of the articles cost money um, uh, set of options where there hasn't <coughs> been very much uh, innovation. And in fact, there's still too much fragmentation across platforms where someone might buy in an app or some other way and they might not have access on the site or they might be a print subscriber or an e-edition subscriber and that might not be valid somewhere else. So we think about this continuum of all the technology that one needs to deliver uh, these kinds of experiences and our aspiration is to line our products up against those. So we have a thing called Composer which is a drag and drop rules engine this is what we're uh, using with, with Mark at The Economist um, so that we can design these experiences to show specific audiences offers to market to them when they're on the site. Um, we have a tool called Piano VX, which is all the plumbing associated with charging digital subscriptions. So discounts and pr <coughs> promotional codes and uh, prices, of course, and billing and refunds and customer care and all of these things to, to, to manage entitlements. And we have a tool called Piano ID, which is our login registration system. It's really important for us to understand things like, for example, what a registered user reads that's different than what an anonymous user reads. So I'll talk more about that kind of data as we go through. Um, and the, the clients for, for these products are, um, are really across media sub-verticals, right? So we have a number of newspapers we work with. Uh, a number of magazine companies that we work with, uh, and a lot of digital native publishers, as well as an increasing amount of um, video over-the-top uh, services that we're working with, who all are focused on the same <coughs> fundamental challenges of how do we take, how do we improve our conversion rates? You know, it used to be even two years ago, the, the people we, t I think five years ago, people I talked to said, should I be doing anything to intercept my users? Should I be talking to them? Should I be charging them at all? I don't want anything to slow them down and decrease potentially the amount of raw traffic I'm getting. Then it moved to, you know, okay, well, should I charge for content? Should I launch a premium offering where I'm charging for things? And now the publishers we're talking to have made that decision, often launched paid products, and are now trying to optimize the number of subscribers that they have. So um, we have built a lot of paywalls as a result, and I want to share some of the data about what we've learned so far. So um, one thing that I frequently hear uh, that, that is <clears throat> false is people say, well, the, the business model for digital content has not really, no one knows what it is yet. Well, that's not really true. There are a lot of companies being very successful. 
uh, in making money off of their digital content. And they're doing it through a limited number of ways, each of which needs an operation, operational commitment to optimize for. There are some companies, Hearst Magazines in the US is an example, who are very focused not on their owned and operated websites, but on distributing content through social channels, right? And that's the, that's the majority of their strategy. There are other uh, companies who actually make 50% or more of their revenue off of the Taboola and Outbrain links uh, at the bottom of the page, which I call bottom links, not just because they're at the bottom, but because they're, 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 they're so, uh, they're, the quality of them is so low. Programmatic advertising has become a, um, a, a dark art that, that some publishers have optimized for, and then other publishers have managed to do quite well still directly selling display, uh, particularly premium uh, companies, even though those CPMs, again, are low. Native advertising, the Atlantic and Quartz, 100% a native advertising model. Affiliate e-commerce is increasingly large, particularly with tech review sites. So New York Times bought a thing called The Wire Cutter and Sweet Home, which is, a, is an editorial business purely of product reviews that makes money only if you click to buy the product on Amazon from their site. Uh, and that's becoming increasingly common where we see networks of sites. They'll do a series of articles on beard trimmers purely because they'll make affiliate fees if any of the readers of those articles go and buy a beard trimmer. Um, direct e-commerce, uh, there are sites like Food52 uh, in the US which purely exist to sell plates and, and serveware and things like that. Uh, and then there's, um, of course, subscriptions and businesses that purely market with events. So I'll show you some of these examples in the future. So basically, we, we now see that there is a digital media specific funnel where what we're trying to do is move users through to higher levels of value. And one thing that's quite specific and great about digital media, which is a benefit that digital media has unlike any other sector, is we can actually monetize the users at every stage of this. So if we have a user who is um, looking at lots of pages, even if they haven't bought, that has value. If we're sending them a newsletter with advertising in it, that has value. And we're, we're able to monetize the users through advertising as we move them towards some kind of purchase decision. So the, the walking through these stages and looking at some actual data, the most important thing in uh, advertising revenue streams is actually the loyalty of the user base. And th this is one of the big uh, conceptual leaps that publishers uh, have been slow to make. I, I uh, was with a, uh, somebody who runs digital at, at, for a magazine company in the US, and, and she said to me, we have this high class problem. We've sold out all our advertising inventory. I have to go find more page views. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? She said, social media, right? Well, I said, well, but if you just took 1% of the existing audience you have and converted them to being newsletter subscribers, you would have far more page views than if you were reinvesting in buying users through social media and trying to do that arbitrage all the time. So this is, an, this is some data from an, uh, an average of basket of sites that we work with. And what you see is this direct and dedicated segment, which is a, 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 a set of rules that we have for qualifying users based on loyalty. And we look at things like what their visit frequency is like, how many pages uh, uh, they look at, um, did they type in the URL directly. Uh, and, and what you see is that that segment is about 16% of the audience, but accounts for about 60% of the page views. And what's really interesting about that is not just the Pareto principle that the most loyal users consume the most page views. You might have assumed that. But what's really interesting is when you look at the, the um, consumption of that audience on the site, they're invariably reading quite different stuff than the casual audience is. So, you know, publishers will say, well, this is my most popular section. But because you're fundamentally looking at averages in tools like Google Analytics, this group, which is 17 million people, 
completely swamps the size of this group, which is 3.8 million people, and you wind up really skewing the average on what the most popular content is. It turns out that this group is looking at things that is tend to be quite specific, and you might think otherwise doesn't perform in digital. So we really focus on saying, how are we going to move more people into this direct and dedicated segment? Another interesting thing about it, we have never worked with a subscription site where um, the number, the people who, the, the number, it's always hard to put this, the number of people who've subscribed at the moment of subscription, 90% of them were in this bucket, which is a way of saying, you're not gonna subscribe to anything unless you're going to that site a lot. So, but very few publishers are deploying tactics to make people come more frequently, to say, hey, here's content you may have missed. Hey, we're publishing something special on Wednesday, you should come back. So we've been deploying a lot of, of uh, messages on sites to say, how about you found this article through Pinterest today, maybe you should pin it so your friends can enjoy it too. Or, um, You've been idle on the page for a minute because you went away to talk on the phone or you went away from that browser tab. Here's some content you may have missed. Or when your mouse goes to leave the viewport, giving you other content recommendations. Try and increase that amount of affinity and, and pages per visit, number of visits. Um, of course, a big area for us as well is ad blocking. None of these users have any value if they have their ad blockers on. So we have a variety of we have a variety of ad blocker detection mechanisms, and we put messages in front of users asking them to turn their ad blockers off, either dismissible or undismissible or some combination thereof. And what's really interesting about that is it's a great cumulative effect. So we get about between 15 and 30 percent of users when we intercept them will turn their ad blocker off. The interesting thing is it doesn't really impact when you intercept those users, it doesn't really impact the uh, number of pages, uh, uh, the amount of traffic, because most of the users who bounce away would have bounced away anyway. Um, the users who are the more dedicated users are much more likely to turn their ad blocker off. We also, of course, are very eager to get users to register because registered users um, are going to visit some multiple of times more uh, depending on the type of content, the frequency of the newsletter itself. They're going to visit far more frequently than an unregistered user. That push of reminding somebody to come back to the site is critical. And so we have um, uh, all kinds of tactics to say, if you've read four recipes, we say to you, hey, you've read four recipes. Wouldn't you like to get those in your inbox every week? The, the conversion on something like that is much, much higher than just a subscription box in the corner. And then, of course, we have a variety of ways that we ask people to pay, um, soft and hard and you know, various moments of intercepting them. And we test a whole lot of creative messages around this. And what, what's really interesting is how wrong people tend to be about the way uh, subscriptions actually work. One thing I hear a lot is young people won't pay for content. Of course we know no millennials will ever pay for anything. That turns out to be exactly the opposite is true. What, what, what is true is that older people who are more jaded uh, and more focused on the print product, they are less likely to pay for digital content than younger readers. So Pew Research Center came out with a study. Turns out that younger people are more, the, 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 the um, sort of quick generation who only wanted to see things on television, turns out that we're all now old and that the, the younger people who are consuming a lot of web content actually prefer reading it to watching it on TV. Moreover, they're also used to buying things a la carte, right? iTunes, cord cutting through Hulu and Netflix. So there's more affinity for subscribing among uh, a younger population than an older one. And we see lots of publishers making a lot of, of, of money in these areas. So what, one thing we like to say is there's no black magic and there's no white magic. On the one hand, there is no magical model that is going to come along and all of a sudden make it so that publishers don't have to do the regular blocking and tackling of 
marketing to consumers. So, you know, we, we at first apps were going to be the thing that saved the publishing industry, and then it was a micropayment model, and now we see things like, um, you know, Google surveys, which was never a particularly scalable approach, or uh, Facebook announced that they were going to do some kind of subscription model, I think yesterday or the day before. And these things can all contribute in small ways, but what they actually do too is make the landscape more complex. And so the, the, regular, the regular work of doing that marketing is very critical. On the other hand, there's this idea of people won't pay. Well, that's true, people won't pay for things they don't value, but we see lots and lots of examples of, uh, of things that people will pay for, and, and, uh, and that's really across uh, areas of media. So it turns out that the current political climate is really great for subscription offerings because there's been a flight to quality. So just to, to wrap this up, the, the, the clients that we're seeing are doing tremendously well um, selling subscription offerings recently. Um, this is interesting, not just because, of course, Trump and, and some of the other political uh, things around the globe are driving people to care more about the news, but this is actually a screenshot from the um, Republican debate, which was uh, carried in the United States by CNBC. And if you wanted to watch that debate and you didn't have CNBC, the only way to get it was to buy it over the top through their website. And if, you, um, if you're in Italy or somewhere where you can't get CNBC on your, um, on your television, the only way to get it is by paying to subscribe and it's behind the paywall on CNBC.com. They sold $2.3 million worth of subscriptions on the day of the Republican debate. So there, there's tremendous opportunity in this market as we talk to and engage and, and create offerings directly for consumers. And with that, I will hand it off to Mark Brinkat, CTO at The Economist. So uh, my talk is going to be a bit about uh, how, how we looked at the disruption that is happening and really is it disruption? Is it a evolution or is it a revolution, really? So when we talk about uh, disruption, uh, there's a lot of terms out there that, that uh, come into mind in terms from the way of thinking to the way you organize yourself to the technologies you look and through the different business models. But really at the heart of it is that uh, the consumer's expectations have changed. And now, when, <clears throat> when uh, they can go and interact with mobile devices, with apps, those changed consumer expectations and also the lower entry barrier to using some of these, uh, of these technologies are leading to this disruption. So before I start talking about that, I wanted to talk a bit about who we are, The Economist. So we have a few values that we hold at heart. We're 174 year old and uh, we've been around for a while. Uh, but at the heart of that are four key values in terms of being um, an advocate for positive change. We were founded to defend free, free trade and we continue keeping that uh, that, uh, that value at heart. We look at those forces that shape the future. We're also a trusted filter. The curation aspect in terms of what we present to our consumer is what The Economist uh, is, is saying. You should read about this. You should know about this. You should know about these things. Uh, we're also global and we are a premium product. Now, you may know us for the magazine, but The Economist itself is a collection of uh, products that uh, we put out there in the market. So from the magazine through to uh, the uh, daily way of consuming uh, the Economist, Economist Espresso. And uh, more recently, we also added um, Economist Films, which is uh, producing short form video documentaries and 
also bites um, around the things that uh, are, are, are happening. But underlying the market has changed, the consumer expectation has changed and when we, when we look at the diff some of the different uh, uh, approaches on how you go and consume content, that has changed from mobile to interacting with, uh, with uh, uh, ch in chat, through video, through push, through link, but also social is, uh, is playing a big part from uh, uh, Facebook and Google and Apple. All three are, are, are trying to, to get you to uh, interact with their platform, want you to stay on their platform, interacting with your content, reading the news there. So, in this talk, what I'll, I'll cover is, is, is three things. With, with that market context in mind, I wanted to share a bit how our thinking evolved, uh, how we approached that thinking in terms of the technologies and platforms we uh, experimented with, we, we have there, and also some of the lessons we learned through this journey. And the art of this is embracing change, is how you adapt and evolve to keep succeeding or keep uh, being relevant. And really we are aligned towards four key strategic intents here around growing our paid content, around uh, increasing our brand awareness, maintaining a viable media business and we know uh, the media business is, uh, is within publishing is, or is, is, is under strain, is under pressure, so how we maintain that media business. And also growing our audience across those uh, uh, different platforms. We are, we're trying to reach out and, uh, and interact with more of those global curious, which is the, the, uh, the, the way we, we uh, describe the audience we're targeting. So one of the things around disruption that we looked at, and we're still evolving around this, is how we organize ourselves. How are we going to organize ourselves to be successful? And uh, one of the approaches which you get to uh, uh, read about quite a bit in, in, in how you approach digital is this concept of being cross-functional. What does it mean being cross-functional? For us, being cross-functional is how we organized our, uh, our teams, how we brought people together from the different uh, disciplines into different uh, product platforms or services teams. How can you think big and start small really? How can you test things? How can you, uh, how can you continually learn from those experiences? And uh, really we started looking at two scenarios. One, contact discovery happens totally off domain. So people decide, you know, they'll go and consume content wherever they want. Or consumers get tired of being barraged by a whole load of, uh, of content and decide to return to their brands and consume their content on domain. And these are two different approaches and in our style we took the, the middle ground and we, uh, we, we, uh, we tried to approach a bit of both of these strategies, hedging our bets on initiatives around each of these areas. <laughs> so in terms of reading The Economist we started looking at how people could read The Economist of domain uh, into more platforms such as you know, launching on, 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 on Apple News, launching online, launching on Facebook instant articles and, <laughs> and, and uh, Medium. We also looked at the distribution of our content on different social channels and we looked at the data and, and determined, you know, some of those social channels weren't really working, but we were focusing on, on all of them, not focusing our attention is on the ones that really made sense. So we stopped doing certain things and concentrated on those social channels that, uh, that uh, were driving more of the engagement. We also changed the way 
we interact with that more visual, more, um, uh, more, more the economist way. In a way. Um, we also expanded into watching the economist from Facebook Live recently uh, after the UK elections. Uh, Zani, our editor in chief, uh, was on Facebook Live uh, uh, giving her thoughts around the elections and the things to come. And also start distributing uh, our content onto platforms that you wouldn't really think you would find The Economist on, like Apple TV or uh, uh, Chromecast or Amazon Fire. We also looked at, you know, how can you listen to The, to the Economist. And actually just uh, last week we've launched uh, Espresso on Amazon Echo, where you can go and get uh, uh, the flash briefing from Espresso. So that's really off domain. What did we do on domain? And on domain, our experience was, you know, serves us well, uh, was there since 2010, didn't really change much since 2010. And uh, what we've done is we redesigned that experience. We redesigned that experience into more responsive, different look, different feel, more around the curation of content, uh, what you should read today, what's those latest updates. But we also, we also looked at the, those products, putting them in a way that they can evolve and iterate, and looking at both qualitative and quantitative data to be able to inform what we do, looking at how are people engaging on our domain, how much time they spend on site, what is the pathway within, uh, within, this, within uh, uh, that, that the different consumers are taking when they come on domain. And that's why we're also we partnered with Piano to deliver uh, the way we interact with the consumer. We also needed to approach how we manage all that data. And out of that, we looked at creating a data platform that enables us to look at product optimization, look at strategy planning, and look at customer insights. And again, in here, we're looking at creating that single customer view whereby we can get to the first party, that third party data, and start really bringing it together and exploring it and looking at those, what those, those insights are. So what's the road ahead for us? Well, the road ahead is really we've been through two and a bit years or three years of uh, quite a lot of change. Change in technology, change in the way we operate, change in uh, the way we deliver features. So for us, we're calling this the next stage is how do we master that? So we call it digital mastery. That sounds nice. And, uh, and we're, we're looking at what digital mastery is. is it really is how do you put value at heart? How you control that flow through uh, and, and uh, the, the flow of, uh, of, of change and how you continue iterating on the right things and keeping that data at the center of it? How can we optimize that? We also need to shift a bit our attention towards our editorial ecosystem. So whereby we have looked at improving the customer experience, the experience for our editorial people is still very much in the, um, I would call it 1990s, but I'll be. Uh, so we need to look at transforming that now and looking at how being still quite a big print publisher and having so many digital channels, how can we optimize uh, those, uh, those processes, that workflow uh, around editorial? We also need to, to evolve that cross-functional thinking and evolve that cross-functional think thinking more towards outside the digital team and within the organization as a whole, because these products don't live in isolation. These products live within the context of the organization. So some wanted to share some of the lessons learned around you know, this 
amount of change. I don't know how many of you know uh, a, a Gartner, but this comes from them. It's uh, how they basically explain uh, different technology triggers and uh, through, through the time. But when we started looking at this, actually, uh, it, uh, it got us thinking because when you are doing such change, you go through these areas from technology or an idea around, hey, let's build our own uh, subscription <coughs> platform. And you get to a point of inflated expectations whereby this thing is going to be the best thing up, uh, after sliced toast. And then you deliver, do you deliver parts of it and you go down into the trough of disillusionment. Is that it? Is this what it does? Is, is this how it works? But actually, really, it's looking at uh, how, how to make use of those capabilities that we've, we, you've put in place and start moving up the slope of enlightenment. You have that big bright idea on how you can make use of it because this is where you need to get to that plateau of productivity. So look at, look at and identify in where you are through your transformation and identify these. Because if you know where you are actually is you can look at techniques towards moving you through this period of change and moving you through this period of disruption. I also have a slide here that outlines a number of other lessons learned. Um, one being uh, for me is Culture Trump strategy is within, within this type of change and this type of disruption is the way, it's not only setting out that, that strategy, but the way you work together, the way you work towards a common goal, and also around some of, uh, some of the other things around being cross-functional that uh, are, you know, what's the role? of that cross-functional team? What's the role of the, those different parts of it? How do we get those, those cross-functional teams to really work within the organizational context? But also when you're doing so, so much change is what are, you know, be ready to pivot because all the technology choices you make will not, be, will not be the last ones you make. Through the transformation, you will go through a period <coughs> Of, uh, of change, a period of choices, a period of pivoting, and that's all right if you manage it. So that's what I had to say in terms of disruption, evolution, or revolution. For us, it's around evolving our thinking. We embraced a best of breed approach. That's one aligned towards the buying commodity and building uh, innovation. We also looked at techniques that enable us to constantly evolve that customer experience and introduce changes and, uh, and different features and also testing those through. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much to uh, Trevor for giving some insight into the industry and a little bit of uh, how Piano solves uh, a number of those uh, industry problems. And of course, thanks to Mark for sharing um, the, the mechanism, the unsophisticated mechanism, as you can see, and the thought and the planning that's gone into The Economist. So time-wise, I know everybody will have a schedule. We said we'd finish at 10 for some networking. Um, having sat in your seats, I know the dreaded question when they say, has anybody got any questions? And then everybody goes, oh, God, I haven't got one. Has anybody got a pressing question they'd like to ask? Great. Please go ahead. Introduce yourself. Carry on. Uh, Pete from Times. Question for Mark. You talked about Amazon TV, uh, Apple, Google. What's the relative success of those platforms? It's early, actually. At, at the moment, you know, the, we, had, uh, we had a good take up, but it's still, uh, compared to the other channels, it's still very small. We also looking at the portfolio of, uh, of documentaries uh, that uh, we're creating and uh, we'll, we're, lo we're looking at that pipeline because at uh, the moment uh, we it, it's, it's they're not published that frequently. So uh, we, we're, we're looking at ways of accelerating that, pushing in more content 
uh, and continue looking at, at the data, what they tell us, and see if, again, it, if it continues being a viable, uh, the moment it's an experiment. Uh, so the moment, if it, it's, 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 it's not turning any subscriptions, it's, 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 it's free. So uh, it's being used to determine, you know, how people engage with it. Is there a potential here? So, yeah. So uh, next year we'll see where it goes. Great. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to make this the last one because otherwise well, there'll be some, somebody throwing bricks at me. <laughs> Go ahead. Say who you are. Uh, so Chris Mercer from Decanter, uh, slightly in the UK, so we'll move there. Um, so I had a question about all these new platforms that you've been experimenting with. How have you had to adapt your editorial structure to make that work? And have you had to do that very much? Yeah, there is. Uh, you know, there, there, there was work that needed to be done there. For example, growing the social team was one. Uh, also, organizing uh, the way editorial is organized is, is not the way editorial is organized because that is something that uh, um, didn't really change. Uh, but people are, are having to, to, to work on uh, uh, different content pieces and, and uh, the distribution part is where um, we're trying to make it easier for them to sort of t t create those packages and, and sending them out. The technology there doesn't really help them at the moment. We gave them, we gave them some, uh, some assistance. The, the transformation around editorial we're looking at is really looking at those work workflows and authoring platforms to enable us to continue supporting because if we leave it as it is with all those channels uh, it, it, it's, it's quite a, a strain uh, on them and also looking at how those channels are performing in terms of the reach uh, I'm not sure if all those channels will be there um, it depends how successful they are it depends uh, you know what the data tells us in terms of the engagement. And uh, as we did with some social channels, if we look at, see that it's, it's people are not interacting with it, then we'll close it and we'll focus on, a, on, on, on the channels that, are, uh, that people want to consume us. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, so number one, the presentations uh, will be available for you to download. So we'll send you a link so that, uh, I know some of you have taken cameras and pictures and photographs and, and written in your notebook, but, but they will be made available, uh, available and thank you to the presenters for, for doing that for us. Um, my big thanks to you attending, uh, taking some time out of your schedules to uh, listen to Trevor and Mark. Uh, thank you for the team for helping put this together and for all the piano people supporting us here today. Um, there is now coffee and more f biscuits probably, biscuits and things. Um, there's obviously water and juice, so please if you can spare some more time and network and come and talk to us, that'd be great. Or more importantly, talk to each other. Thank you very much. <laughs>